Hi everyone, Rich Savell here. Today we're going to be talking about the propofol infusion syndrome. We're going to talk about when to think about it, why does it happen, and what to do about it. So let's get started. Propofol is very commonly used in the intensive care unit. And the idea here is that this common drug can have some side effects that can be very concerning. And although many people who work in ICUs are aware of the propofol infusion syndrome, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to describe how it happens. And I find that that actually helps you keep it in mind when you're using this drug. Used in the right population of patients, this is a very important, very safe drug. The overall incidence of propofol infusion syndrome is extremely low, less than 1%, and most of the literature is really just case reports. This was originally described primarily in children, and the risk factors, as you can see here, are having uh, being young and being on very high doses of the drug, and we'll describe later on what those specific dosages are. But the concept here is, if you are part of a critical care team caring for patients and you're on continuous infusion of propofol, it's something to think about. Again, some of the other risk factors are being on a high-fat, low-carbohydrate intake diet, receiving a catecholamine infusion, and receiving steroid therapy. So it's very interesting that many of these issues are associated with being critically ill. But what I find really fascinating is the particulars of the mechanism of this drug. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit about some of the symptoms. Again, you see lactic acidosis in a patient who hasn't had that before, cardiovascular collapse or failure, and we'll talk more about some of the cardiac issues. You can often see refractory bradycardia, ventricular arrhythmias, rhabdomyolysis, and again, when we talk about the mechanism, of this, you'll start to see why. This can lead to acute kidney injury and a requirement for renal replacement therapy, as well as hypertriglyceridemia. So again, if a patient's on propofol and you start to see that you're having problems from a cardiovascular standpoint, or they're developing rhabdomyolysis, renal failure, and uh, cardiovascular issues and lactic acidosis, that constellation should make you start to think. And the idea is, because of this, although it's rare, the idea is to do your best to limit the use of propofol in the ICU, or if you have to keep it on, to have a low threshold to be concerned about propofol infusion syndrome. I wanted to take a moment to talk about some of the other cardiac issues, and in general, it's cardiovascular dysfunction, but specifically refractory bradycardia, a widening of the QRS, ventricular tachyarrhythmias, cardiogenic shock, and asystole. So to talk about the pathophysiology is very interesting in that the propofol itself is in a lipid emulsion, and the propofol molecule itself inhibits enzymes both in the mitochondria and around the mitochondria. So one of the enzymes is uh, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, and that's a outer membrane mitochondrial enzyme. And there's a little picture there of, of L-carnitine. You can see it sort of looks like an amino acid with a couple extra uh, groups, carbon moieties here. But the focus is, is that the lipids, when you need to be able to break them down, you're inhibited from breaking them down from the propofol itself. So the first issue is you can see hypertriglyceridemia because of the inability to break down triglycerides because of the propofol. And in addition, you can develop anaerobic metabolism because of the propofol inhibiting certain enzymes in the mitochondrion. And again, you can see propofol-mediated defects in beta-oxidation of fatty acids cause fatty acids to tend to accumulate in the liver. And you can see, with propofol use, elevated free fatty acids. And that itself can be arrhythmogenic. Again, for the reasons I described previously, you can see elevated triglycerides because the propofol can inhibit the ability of the body to break down triglycerides into free fatty acids and triglycerol. 
And then importantly, the propofol can cause an elevated lactate because it directly affects the mitochondrial electron transport chain. So prevention of propofol infusion syndrome requires a high index of suspicion as a critical care provider that you try to limit the use of propofol to less than 48 hours, but this is sometimes impossible, and that you try to keep the dose of propofol less than 67 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Again, the focus here is to be cognizant of this disease process and that this propofol infusion syndrome can creep up on you because the patients who are critically ill are at high risk. The patients who are critically ill often need higher energy but are prevented from utilizing the energy because of the aforementioned discussion. And keeping it in mind will help to keep your patients alive. This is an incredibly safe drug when used in the intensive care unit, but it's very important to keep this in mind when you're caring for patients. So the treatment of propofol infusion syndrome, first, stop the drug. Second of all, aggressively manage the renal dysfunction with renal replacement therapy if needed. In terms of the cardiovascular support, if they're severely bradycardic and require a pacemaker, that needs to be placed. If they require inotropes and vasopressors, start them and have a low consideration for utilization of extracorporeal life support. This was our little mini discussion of propofol infusion syndrome. It's important to have a high index of suspicion. I find the particular mechanism of this process to be fascinating, that you're actually inhibiting the ability of the mitochondrion to function, that you're inhibiting the ability of the triglycerides to be broken down, and this anaerobic metabolism can rapidly lead to cardiovascular dysfunction, the hyperlipidemia can lead to cardiovascular dysfunction, and this can lead to rhabdomyolysis and acute kidney injury. Propofol is a very safe drug when used in the critically ill patient, but it's very important to keep this in mind. Thanks for listening.